Good morning once again to another edition of Wednesday Wake Up. We're going to be taking a dive into God's Word and talking about the feeding of the 5,000. It's a familiar passage, I think, to most of us, uh, and it has a special place in my heart because of the youth group, because of uh, one of the sessions that I remember that uh, you all had to figure out whether it was five fish and two loaves or five loaves and two fish, and, and it was a, a pretty funny time. So uh, that's why I, I have a, a special place in my heart for this passage. Um, but it's, uh, it's also, even though it's familiar, it's something that um, you know, God's Word is always uh, revealing new elements, and there's always something new to learn, even for a familiar passage, and that's what God proved to me once again this past week, popped a couple things on my heart about this passage that I never thought of before, and that's what I'd like to share with you today. So, here now, reading of the Gospel according to John. This is John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up to the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were, who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told the disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. They filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the feeding of the 5,000, it's, uh, it's definitely a familiar passage because it's not only captured here in the Gospel of John, but it's captured in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that's pretty unusual, actually, it's very unusual, because other than Jesus' resurrection, uh, this is the only miracle that's captured in all four Gospels. And if we understand that, that God's Word, that the Bible is inspired by God, um, then we have to take into consideration, why did God want to make sure that we heard this passage? Why is this so important? God inspired four different gospel writers to write this down, and they all did, almost word for word, the same, uh, the same event. And that's another thing to keep in mind, that this is an event. This is an actual happening that happened. It's not a, um, it's not a parable. It's not a story that Jesus said to, to convey a message. This is an event that happened, and it was captured by all four of the gospel writers. And so what is it that we need to learn from this, or what can we learn just today from this passage? Another thing to put this passage into context, and this is the advantage of having the same passage work in uh, all of the other Gospels, is we get a little background as to what was happening before this. Uh, it says in, in this passage of John, it says, after this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So what is the this that they're talking about? Uh, well, number one is that um, the disciples prior to this were empowered to, to heal and to cast out demons, and they were sent out into the world to do Jesus' work, to continue to spread his message and to do uh, his work. And they came back uh, so excited to tell Jesus about what they've done, and then they were exhausted. Uh, and so Jesus wanted to give them a break, wanted to, to take them away from the crowds and the chaos and, and the messiness of this world and go in somewhere uh, off on a mountaintop alone so that they can rest. 
Another thing that happened just prior to this is that John the Baptist, the one that we read about in the beginning of the Gospel of John, the one that pointed the way to Jesus, the one that was the voice crying out in the wilderness, he was killed. And he was a friend of Jesus and a friend of the disciples. Um, and so that was another reason for them to get away, to be alone, to mourn for the, for the death of their friend. John the Baptist was murdered uh, for pointing the way, for, for doing what God wanted him to do. And so they were saddened by that. And so they tried to get in a boat and get away and go off on a quiet mountaintop. But see, Jesus and the disciples were getting pretty popular because they were, they were curing people. They were, they were teaching. Uh, they, were, they were doing incredible works of God. And, and people wanted to be a part of that. And so the people ran around the side of the Sea of Galilee and met them uh, right where they got off the boat. Uh, and so their quiet time was, was no longer quiet time. It was... Um, surrounded by a bunch of people who wanted to learn more from them. And, and because those people ran, you know, away from their homes, away from wherever they were to go meet up with these disciples, wherever they, wherever they docked their boat, um, they were far away from everywhere else um, that they would normally be, their, their homes, their food, their everything else. And that's why Jesus had sympathy for them. He said, you know, they, these people are far away from home. And the other gospel passages, it uh, some of the disciples even said, listen, let's let these people go back home. It's getting late so that they can go get something to eat. And then Jesus did something interesting. And this is one of the points that um, that I, I thought popped out to me more this time than it ever did. Uh, he, he turned to Philip, and Philip is one of the first disciples. If you remember, Philip and Nathaniel were the first disciples of, of Jesus. And he turned to Philip and he said, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat. And then it says in the gospel, he says, he said this, Jesus said this to test him for he himself knew what he was going to do. So Jesus tested Philip. That sounds strange. I mean, it doesn't sound like a very God-like thing to do, a very Jesus-like thing to do to, to test people. It sounds like uh, he's being tested to either pass or fail so in other words if he passed he would go to heaven if he failed he, he would go to hell or something like that and that's that doesn't sound like a very uh, nice thing to do right do you like to be tested no one likes to be tested every time i took a test i would always kind of get nervous beforehand even if i knew what i was going to be tested on it doesn't sound like a very godlike thing to do but what what is this testing all about and did jesus test his disciples and if he did does his does God test us today? So I looked into that word. It's, uh, the Greek word is perazo, uh, which means to test, but it also means to tempt. It's the same word that we read in the gospel when Jesus was, was tempted by the devil uh, out in the wilderness. In fact, the, the word for tempter comes from the same word perazo. And so this testing is is more than, than just a, a pass-fail. It's more than, than just a, if you get this wrong, then you're going to be punished. It's really can be boiled down to, to either following God's will or not following God's will. And it could be as simple as that. Being tested means, are you going to follow what God wants you to do? Or are you going to follow maybe your own will that may not be God's will? And so this testing, I think, happens today. And I think it's okay. It's not, it's not a testing of condemnation, because here's the good news, is that Philip failed his test, right? Jesus asked him, he said, what, well, where are we going to get all this food? And, and Philip just based his reaction, based his response on the realities around him about, you know, there, there's no way we'd ever have enough money to buy all these people food. And, and we're too far away from... Uh, from their hometown to even buy the food. See, Philip was from that area. He knew where to buy the food. And he said, even if we had enough money, uh, how are we going to get it here? Jesus based all of his uh, wishes, all of his dreams, all of his answers on the realities around him and not on God's will. And so Philip failed his test. But what happened? Did Jesus just give up on him? Did Jesus condemn him? Did Jesus punish him? No. Jesus still did the miracle. See, Jesus, our God, is, is a God of redemption, is a God of second chances, a God of restoration. 
And Jesus still performed the miracle, even though Philip failed the test. And Philip wasn't the only man to, the only person to, to fail a test. I mean, think about the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were given paradise, were given everything, and just said, you could just do whatever you want, just stay away from this one tree. And they failed their test. But once again, God at that moment had restoration, had a plan for Jesus to come and take away that sin. And so we are tested. I believe we're given tests every single day. I mean, it may not be monumental decisions, but every single day you have an opportunity to, to follow what you think God wants you to do or not. And I think that you'll know what that means. I think that if you, if you don't follow what you think God wants you to do, you will have guilt. You will have second thoughts. You'll have uh, reservations. But if you do follow God's will, you will be put on a path and be blessed more than you could have imagined. Just like Jesus produced more than Philip could have imagined by multiplying those loaves and those fish. So I would encourage you to think about all the choices that you have throughout your day and, and put it in the context of this is just a choice. It's not a choice that I'm going to be condemned if I get wrong because God doesn't do that. It's a choice to either follow the will of God or to not follow the will of God. And, and it could be as simple as that. And I think you'll know in your gut um, what the will of God is compared to what the will of God is not. And I encourage you to, to put it into that context and to know that, that you're not going to be punished if you get it wrong because Jesus is always going to be there to, to lift you back up again if you do. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, this fact that Jesus made sure that there was nothing wasted. Right? There was this, this one little boy's lunch that in all reality could have fed maybe two people and it fed more than 5,000 because 5,000 was only the men in the group. And that's just the way that they did it back in the day. Uh, they, they counted the men and then they assumed that, okay, for every man, that's one person in the family. So multiply that times, let's say two, three, depending on how many kids they had. Um, so there's more than 5,000. So figure maybe 15, 20,000 people were fed uh, with just those five loaves and two fish. And and Jesus made sure that nothing was wasted. And they picked up all the baskets. He said, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. You see, when you give something to Jesus, when you give yourself to Jesus, and you would honestly give what you can give without reservation, Jesus will never, ever waste that. There's, um, there's uh, thoughts that I come into mind is, is sometimes I'll get an idea um, and I think, ooh, maybe I should keep that for a, a sermon or maybe I should keep that for uh, when, when we have a youth group again and we can, we can, you know, we can talk about it with more people. Um, but then as soon as I think that, I think about the passage from Exodus when, when, Jesus, uh, when, when God gave manna to the people and he said, you know, listen, I'm going to give you food every single day. Don't keep it for the next day. Trust that I'm going to give you and I'm going to supply for you what you need tomorrow, just like I did for you today. Some people were just being people, and they didn't listen. And what happened to that manna? It got infested with maggots. It's a pretty nasty image, right? And so whenever I think, you know, God has given me a thought, an idea, and I don't know if he's going to give me one tomorrow, but there's no, re no reason for me to wait, because he's going to use what he's given me, and nothing will go to waste. He's going to, to make the most use of this thought that he popped in my head. And even if one or two or three people hear it, that's who's supposed to hear it. Nothing will ever go to waste. And so when, when you're given the option to, to give something, to give of yourself to, to someone else, to give, to give willingly um, for, for their benefit, not your own, and essentially for Jesus and not your own, nothing will ever be wasted. God made that clear in God's word today. So let's wrap it up with that, that, uh, that this passage is, is super powerful. And, um, and, and we 
can be considered to be tested by God, but we, we worship a God who redeems, who, who doesn't test us to condemn us and tests us to give us the free will to follow him and to understand what it means to do that and the benefits that come along with that. And, and when we do, nothing is ever wasted. Our efforts, our resources, our everything is not wasted uh, when it's truly given to him. So let's wrap that up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your message, for the ability to get together today to hear it, for uh, your, your will for us that, that surpasses this moment uh, and will be with us uh, wherever we go. Please give us the strength to continue to hear your will, um, the strength to follow it, and the strength to know that, that your will for us um, is, is always better than our will for ourselves. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Take care, folks, and we'll catch you next time.